Well, hey folks, welcome back to the Speaker Builder channel. My name is Jeff, and today I want to continue in my multi-part series on building a high fidelity reproduction system. And today we'll be talking all about drivers. And I argue just as speakers are the most important component of any system, the drivers are the most important part of any speaker system. Now we have a couple considerations to think about. Uh, first off, we have to consider what kind of a layout are we gonna select for our system? Are we gonna choose a two-way design or a three-way design? Those are the most common layouts that are out there in, in music speaker world. There are single driver systems. I've just seen this recently. I'll talk about that in just a minute. And then there are four-way systems. So I'm gonna cover those just briefly and then we'll get into two-way versus three-way. And we're talking about benefits versus drawbacks with each choice we make. Now with a single driver system, uh, I've just discovered these. Uh, Pearl Audio, I believe is the company name. They're making a speaker system called Sibelius and it has a single driver at the top of a tall tower box. And given all the tower speakers that have an array of drivers on them, it's a little, little funny looking to see a single driver up there. There are a number of benefits to that type of design, and uh, obviously there's a lower cost because you have just one driver and no crossover components. But also because no crossover components are in that design, presuming they're not having to filter out any uh, deviation in response. Uh, there would be a cleaner response to the driver because it has no crossover components to constrain clarity and dynamics. And then you have a single point source for tremendous imaging that's possible with that type of design. So big benefits to that type of system, major drawbacks. And one of them I haven't listed on my list, but one of them I want to mention right off is trying to get a driver to produce full frequency response is a really tough tall order, really tough challenge. Uh, first, you're limited to the size of the driver. That's the first problem. So I've seen full range drivers at Mattisound where I go do a lot of my speaker shopping. And the largest I see, there's six and a half inch ones and there's eight inch ones. Some of those drivers have a response curve uh, that deviates within 10 or 15 dB from the lowest frequency up to say 10 or 15,000 cycles. And 10 or 15 dB deviation is way too much in my, my humble opinion. There was one I saw by uh, a company called Mark Audio. I believe the Mark Audio drivers are what are being used in the Sibelius speaker. At least that, it looks like a Mark Audio driver. They look very similar, the different options that Mark Audio offers. And there was one for eight inch driver that had pretty nice flat response. So uh, I think the limited bass response, first off, because you only have an eight inch driver at max, six and a half or eight, you can't get into 12, 10 or 12 inch bass driver, uh, a full range driver. It just won't produce flat response. So you have that problem. Uh, there'll be some Doppler distortion if you have a single driver that's producing low frequencies and upper frequencies. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, another problem with those kind of speakers is that you're choosing just one driver for the full frequency response. So whatever the character of the highs and the mids and the lows, they're all fixed. Whereas if you have multi, multiple drivers uh, uh, that you're choosing, you can select the kind of high frequency driver you want that you like. You can select in a three-way design, a, sp a specific type of mid-range driver with a particular kind of a cone and tonal character to it. And then the bass driver can be very specifically selected in terms of its design and the, the, the alignment you use. So much more flexibility in getting exactly what you want if you're in a two or three way system versus a single driver, you've got whatever you've got to sound like buying a speaker system that's already been built. Whatever it sounds like is whatever it sounds like. There's not much you can do with it. So single driver systems have their appeal for a number of folks. I think if you're listening to classical music, opera, choral music, chamber music, those kind of things. And, and, I, and there's some wonderful music in that in that genre. Th those speakers probably would perform exceptionally well. But for me, I'm listening to a lot of modern music, jazz. I want to hear the cymbals. I want to hear the bass player. I want to hear the kick drum. I want to hear all these things that a full range system can provide that I don't think a, a single driver system like that could compete with. So that's my opinion on that. Uh, let me talk briefly about a four-way design. What we're talking about there then is, whereas you've got about two octaves that the tweeter handles, you've got about two octaves or more that the bass driver is handling, and then the mid-range driver from 100 to 3,000 is about five octaves. 
With a four-way design, you're taking that mid-range driver with five octaves and subdividing it into two drivers, a smaller and a larger one, perhaps. And so now you have a four-way design. Bass driver is doing the same thing a three-way design does. Tweeter's doing pretty much the same job as a three-way design. You're just adding another driver for mid-range. And it makes sense to have each driver then of a four-way design covering a couple of octaves, two and a half octaves or so, but I, in my opinion, and I think it's the opinion of most d designers, very few four-way designs out there. And I think the reason is for the added additional driver and additional box space and additional crossover components, or in the case of an active design, you have an whole extra amplifier you have to add to the system. I don't think the expense is warranted for the gain. There's not much gain there. There is some gain, and if you want to go to the trouble expend and spend the money, diminished um, Doppler effect and so forth, more power handling and so forth, but I don't think there's enough gain to warrant a four-way design. So uh, so we're only going to be talking about two-way versus three-way. Now let's go through this benefits versus drawbacks. So with a two-way design then, uh, the benefit obviously is just two drivers versus three, so less expense, right? And then you only have crossover components to for one crossover point versus for two. So fewer crossover points in a two-way design. So that's advantageous. Versus with a three-way, you've got the greater expense of another driver and additional crossover parts. Uh, number two, in addition, in addition to the uh, fewer parts, you have only one crossover point with a two-way design. And so you have shared frequencies between these drivers. It's virtually inescapable. But you only have one set of shared frequencies to deal with. Here, you've got two sets of shared frequencies, those between tweeter and mid, and those between mid and bass. So more problems, potentially, and more things to deal with. That's what the crossover is designed to do to limit that, those shared frequencies. But you've got additional problems with a three-way. And then a simpler passive design. Uh, when I was reading uh, Speaker Builder magazine way back in the day, the DIY builders were suggesting to avoid a three-way passive design, do two-way passive only. In my three-way design that I built in those days, I had an electronic crossover between the bass and the mid, a uh, bass and the satellite, I should say, and then a passive crossover between this, the mid and the tweeter for a satellite speaker. So it was a two-way, uh, two, two, uh, by amplifier, I should say, a three-way system by amped with one amp driving the bass speaker, these very bass speakers, in fact, from the 90s and then one passive uh, satellite speaker with a two-way pass a crossover and one amplifier driving those. So that's an, that's an alternative I'll mention probably again later on. But so Now what about the drawbacks of a two-way design? So first off, you have limited, like I talked about with the single driver system, uh, you have limited bass response because you have a limited driver size. In this case, I have an 8-inch driver just as a, as a, as a model for us today. Most two-way systems are using no bigger than a six and a half inch bass driver, bass mid driver. And so you're not gonna get a lot of bass from a six and a half driver. Now you can, in a tower speaker design, load up a whole bunch of those six and a half drivers for bass response, uh, and, and folks are building those. And you can recover some of that lost bass response by having multiple drivers. But nonetheless, we're talking about a two-way design and a single driver, just for the sake of argument, if you had only one bass mid driver, you're, you can only go up to six and a half, eight if you push it. This one actually has, because it's a metal cone, has a nasty resonance at about uh, 2,000 cycles, uh, a nasty peak that it produces, and so it's not really useful in a two-way design like this, unfortunately. Otherwise, I might actually build this system using these tweeters. But So these are sitting on the shelf collecting dust. Uh, I have built 8-inch two-way systems successfully. You have to buy the right base mid driver today. I would be choosing the SB. It's a ceramic coated driver. It's a lot of money, 125 bucks, but it's got nice smooth response into the two, 3,000 cycle range as it smoothly drops off. That would work very well in a passive design with a tweeter, maybe with this tweeter, this Eton. It's a wonderful sounding tweeter. So that I actually wanted to build that system. I've kind of shifted away from that. But anyway, so it two-way design, Six and a half max, uh, eight if you really push it, and I have it. I have some eight successful eight-inch two-way designs, and I'm really happy with. But uh, you can't get much bigger than that. And in this room here, 200 square feet, eight-inch. I have it. Uh, the, the brothers to these, I put them out here and listened. They just don't produce enough bass for this size room. They're fine. The eight-inch two-way system I have in my 100 square foot office, they work great there. 
So it depends on application there, but you certainly can't get into 10 or 12 inch base drivers in a two-way design. So that's a problem. Possible beaming above a thousand cycles. Again, if it's an eight inch drive, six and a half, you're okay probably. As you get into eight inch, you start getting beaming. That, in other words, the driver does not uh, have, a, have a dispersion pattern that's wide. It, the, the dispersion begins to narrow as the frequency rises because of the size of this driver. Not a problem in a smaller mid-range driver, but as you get into larger ones, the off-axis response drops off. And so you get what's called beaming, and you don't want that. And so you're limited to that in, in terms of size because of that problem. And then obviously lower power handling in a two-way versus three-way. Generally speaking, you could build a two-way with massive drivers and you could, you know, massive magnets and so forth, and build a really uh, budget three-way and, and get the same power handling, obviously. But generally speaking, you're going to have more power capability with a three-way design. And then finally, a greater Doppler distortion, and I want, need to explain that a little bit. We're familiar with Doppler, the Doppler effect at the train stop where you're sitting at the train tracks and the train is coming by, Hopefully you're not on the tracks, right? And the train is blowing its horn, and the pitch of the horn is raised as the, as the, uh, the train approaches, and then as it passes and goes away, and it's still blowing its horn, the, the waves of the, the horn pitch drops, and it's because approaching the intersection, the, the, the horn's waves were compressed, and traveling away from the intersection, the horn's waves are elongated, and so the the compressed waves raise the pitch, the elongated waves lower the pitch. We've all heard that, the pitch falling as the train passes. Well, that same kind of distortion happens in a bass driver when you have a driver as this in a two-way design. Let's say it's producing a 1,000 cycle frequency and moving like that. I'm going to just try to move it to do that. And then it simultaneously produces a 30 or 40 cycle wave, say, you know. Now you've got the, the 1,000 cycle waves modulated and carried on the 40 cycle waves, let's say 40 cycles. And so those waves then will arrive, the, the 1,000 cycle waves will be coming at you doing this, and they will be arriving uh, a little compressed and then a little bit elongated as, it, as it's carried away and then compressed and elongated. Does that make, I hope that makes sense. It's called Doppler distortion. It's a common thing. You can read about Doppler distortion in speaker systems. Now, I have to say, listening to my 8-inch 2A system just about every day up in my office, I'm not sitting and hearing that Doppler distortion and complaining, oh, that Doppler distortion, I, it's, it's so annoying. I'm not noticing the Doppler distortion. Now, but if I put test tones in a in a, my 8-inch driver with a 1,000 cycle I mentioned or 1,500 and then I put a 40 cycle tone on top of that, I could probably hear that 1,000 cycle tone modulated on the 30 cycle wave and you could probably detect that easily, that Doppler distortion. So there, the Doppler distortion is there whether your ears attend to it or not. Uh, and obviously you limit that. You don't eliminate Doppler distortion with any driver system because you're, every driver is producing a range of frequencies. There's going to be some Doppler distortion effect with every driver, but you want to minimize it. And so with a three-way design, you select a base driver that's only going to produce up to 100 cycles, and that's it. And the mid-range driver is not subject to trying to reproduce anything below 100 or 150 in my case, so uh, to minimize Doppler distortion as much as possible. So the three-way has that advantage. So that would be the other advantage of the four-way. You, you, you take another notch up on that in minimizing Doppler distortions of any kind in the mid-range frequencies. Okay, so that's all for two-way versus three-way. And again, my preference is going to be for three-way if you've seen in my systems. Uh, but again, I built a bunch of two-way systems, very satisfied with those. So uh, for me, it's depending on the context. For my shop, I have a six-and-a-half two-way speaker system. Works great. And that's all I need in the shop. For my office, just listening to music while I'm working, the eight-inch two-way sounds great. I'm really pleased with it. But now if I want to do critical listening in my living room and I put really nice music on and I want to really hear everything well, I want a three-way design. So it depends on context, in my opinion. Okay, next I want to talk about multiple drivers in speaker systems. Since we've now already thought about a two-way versus a three-way, now the next question we might have is, should we use multiple drivers? Two tweeters, two mid-range drivers, or two bass drivers, or more. So now most systems, first off, are not using two tweeters in their system of the same type. And there's a lot of good reasons for that having to do with uh, what we're going to be talking about here. 
but you never see two tweeters. Now for mid-range drivers, we do see systems with two mid drivers. So we wanna talk about what the benefits versus drawbacks of two drivers versus one in the mid-range. And there are gonna be some different issues with two mids versus two base drivers. So let's talk first about uh, the benefit of greater, and in either case, greater power handling, number one. Obviously, if you've got two drivers of the same size, you're gonna choose either to use one or you're gonna use two of the same type, then you're gonna have more greater power handling. And that means greater dynamic range. Uh, number two, increased dynamic range means if you have your two drivers producing your no nominal sound pressure level in your room and you have some peaks in the music, those can handle those peaks much better because each one is only doing half as much work compared to if you only had one driver. And so you no loss in dynamics uh, with two drivers versus, versus potential of loss with one driver. And then faster transient response, that warrants some discussion too. So uh, let's talk about transient response. Now, uh, this, is a, this is an issue for base drivers. I don't think transients are an issue with mid-range drivers, but let's talk about, suppose you have one base driver versus two, and this is per channel, and, you're cons and uh, you wanna know what the benefit is here in terms of transient response. This especially is true, well, it would be true in, the, in any case, but with a sealed, speaker system this improves transient response versus a uh, vented so what is that all about so now with a bass driver especially true with the bass driver versus the mid and highs we think about concerns for transient response what we mean we get the word transition from transient the bass driver has to transition from one frequency to another pretty quickly as the music program being fairly in modern music being fairly complex has to produce one wave and then another wave and then a different size wave uh, at, at different frequencies. And it's switching from one frequency to another instantaneously. And when you have a fairly heavy cone like this, a large cone driver with a heavy, heavy mass compared to lighter cones, and it has to try to make those transitions happen, it has a tough time. And now, especially if it's in a sealed box, the sealed box tends to produce provides some suspension. A sealed box is also called an acoustic suspension. It provides sort of like a little spring when, you, when the driver goes in, it compresses the air inside the box and that provides some res resistance to movement. And so because of that suspension, it's able to handle transients a lot better. It, it, there, there's a downside to that. We'll get into the bass speaker design in a little bit uh, in our third video on boxes of the series. But anyway, so not to get further down the road on that, but in, I'm using vented systems which are notorious for poorer transient response comparatively. So one of the ways to handle and manage improving transient response, and I've just kind of come to this and would now perhaps design base systems differently, but uh, to improve transient response, if you add two drivers, now each driver is only doing half the work. And that means it's only moving much half as much or in that ballpark, much less. And so when it has to do a transition, it can do it much more easily. So two drivers improve transient response. If that makes sense, uh, systems I've seen uh, that ex exasperate that, to go, or that is perhaps to say, goes after that to the max. If you look at the IRS fives that uh, Paul McGowan has in the PS Audio, he's got a lot of YouTube videos on what he's doing and he shows off his IRS fives. Their whole system costs a hundred grand. It's insane. They're seven feet tall, 200 pounds a piece boxes. It's four of them in there. It's crazy, but it does have eight drivers, base drivers. I believe the 12 inch base drivers in each of the two boxes in behind the, the, the tall uh, full range speakers that are in front. So you got eight drivers doing the work of one. Yeah, each driver is only moving a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit. And so the transit response is gonna be fantastic. In fact, that system will probably go flat down to the driver's residence because it has so little, even in a sealed box, that the acoustic suspension is producing with the driver moving so little, it's offering no constraint to the driver's uh, function because it's so functioning at such a small degree, each one, because it's sharing all the power between eight, seven other drivers. And so that's just really amazing. But at a huge expense, of course. So the, another drawback to that is huge power. Anyway, so if you do multiple drivers, you have improved transit response. That isn't such a problem here with mid-range drivers. I don't think transients are a big issue because the drivers are much lighter. 
And so the amount of movement they're making, and of course they're producing upper frequencies, which involve much, much less motion compared to bass drivers having to produce low waves, big waves, long waves, and they're moving a lot more. You can see that in the, your speaker system, you pull your covers off, whatever, and you watch the drivers at a given volume level. You barely can see the mid-range drivers moving back, but the bass drivers are moving a lot more. So transient response issues are going to be much more significant with bass, in the bass region. Okay, so what are the drawbacks to multiple drivers? Uh, obviously, one drawback is greater expense. And you really, it's one of two things. You're either going to, if you've chosen a driver and you're considering two drivers, well, you're doubling your cost. Now you have two drivers, that's great, but you've doubled your cost. And it has to be warranted, the advantage has to be warranted for that. Uh, in terms of power handling we mentioned, I get plenty of power from one single five and a quarter driver in my systems. Uh, and they're not much different than these. This would produce plenty of power for the mid-range. Uh, I think you'd be very happy. You could hurt your ears probably with these. So two are, are, not, are not necessary in any way. It's not like you're lacking in something and you need to. So uh, greater expense or you choose a lower quality as I've done here. These are really actually very, very inexpensive. I bought these for cheap money. And so if I had six, if I had $100 to spend, I could buy one mid-range driver or I could buy two cheaper ones. I think that's a net loss to have two drivers of, low, of inferior quality versus one high quality driver. So I'm pre my preference is for a single high quality driver. Uh, a number two, uh, that was number two, lower quality drivers. Number three, internal box volume is doubled. So if you have two drivers, you're going to need twice, twice as much box to house two drivers versus one. So it's a bigger box. Not that that's the end of the world, but something to consider, a downside. And then uh, comb filtering is something we need to talk about. Now this is something that would be a problem with mid-range drivers, not so much with bass. The length of bass waves for two bass drivers is so great in the bass region, say at 100, I think it's 105, 10 cycles, the bass wave length is about a 10 feet. And so having two drivers next to each other in a box, they function as one driver virtually. So there's no concern with comb filtering in the bass region. Uh, with two drivers or three or four, whatever. They'll all act, no matter how many, they'll all act as one driver. Mid-range drivers are very different. As you get up in the upper frequencies, the wavelengths get down to a, an inch, a couple inches. The problem here is then, if you have two drivers and they're in different locations relative to the location of your ear, then the waves of one will arrive at your ear just before the, the waves of the other driver, given they're producing the same waves at the same time. And that's going to cause some problems. You'll be peaks and nulls. And if you graph the peaks and nulls out, you see a peak at one frequency and a null, and then another peak and another null, and another peak and another null. And so you have this graphically looks like a comb. And so they call it comb filtering. Uh, I, 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 I use the term wave interference patterns to describe what's going on there. Uh, that certainly, as I mentioned before, about never seeing two tweeters, that would be a huge problem with two tweeters with uh, this comb filtering effect. So you know, because of the wavelength is so short for two tweeters and you can't get the drivers close enough together. That's about two, that's about three or four inches apart. And those wavelengths above 3000 are only going from an inch or two down to very, very, very short wavelengths. And so you'd have ma major comb filtering problems with two tweeters, so you never see two tweeters. Mid-range drivers, it only starts to be a problem in the upper region. But uh, one of the ways, the workarounds to that, if you want to use two mid-range drivers, a common design, it's called a MTM, or mid-tweeter mid. And I designed this speaker actually, and I cut the ears off these to uh, get them very, very close, get the centers close. That allows these centers to be close together and these centers to be close as close as I can get them. So that's an MTM design. Now, if you just set this up with a box where the height of the tweeter is at ear height, then the arrival time of the mid-range frequencies from each of these drivers will, will be the same at your ear because they're the same distance away because they're the same above and below the height of the tweeter. Does that make sense? So you can eliminate some of that problem with uh, comb filtering with two mid-range drivers if you do it that way. I've seen two mid drivers, one below the other, and the tweeters up top. I've commonly seen that. Uh, unless there's a, it's kind of a, called a two and a half way design with a lower mid driver 
is really filtered down at a lower frequency, so it never gets up above, say, 500 or something. And this one's the only, the only driver. The two of them share, in other words, they're low frequencies, and then as the frequency rises, one is filtered out, and the only the other one is carrying the frequencies up to the crossover region here. So, but that's not a two-way design, it's a two-and-a-half-way design. I'm talking about shared drivers in a two- or three-way design. You've got some comb filtering issues you want to think about more and concern yourself with. MTM solves that. It's a great way to go. Uh, you see this in the, uh, commonly, you see this design in theater speakers. The center channel is a MTM commonly, sat on, sat on its side. It's often, often sat on its side for whatever reason. It doesn't really matter, but uh, that speaker's going to produce comb filtering in the room, but that's another story. So, again, it's only, a, it's only in the upper regions of these speakers where you're going to have some comb filtering, potential comb filtering issues. Okay, lastly, I want to address specific driver selection issues and uh, just to share my preferences and, and uh, explain those. I don't really have benefits versus drawbacks to, to address here. Uh, this is a matter of personal taste. Starting with tweeters, there are a multitude of different types of tweeter designs. These are, of course, the comb, the comb uh, designs. There are ribbon tweeters. There are planar tweeters. There's a air motion transformer, I believe is a AMT uh, tweeters. There's a number of other different types. So uh, you can look at all these different types of tweeters and listen to them. They all sound a little different. Nobody has agreed. The, cystis, the industry has, has no agreement as to what constitutes a real high quality tweeter. And so it's, it's a personal preference for everyone. Now, my preference for choosing dome tweeters is for the following reasons. First of all, they're very affordable. A high quality ribbon tweeter is just going to be more expensive. I found them to be very pricey. Uh, these have good dynamic range. In other words, they can go from moderate to bright to moderate. They can, they can really, really pop. Uh, ribbon tweeters and, and planars, I believe, both in both cases are limited in their dynamic range. And so one of the workarounds for that that I've seen, like in the IRS-5s I mentioned earlier, they just, they just stacked up a bunch of ribbon tweeters, six or eight or ten or twelve, or however many there are in that IRS-5 system, a whole range of them, the full length of the speaker cabinet. So you get all those tweeters, each one's doing a tiny little bit of work, you recover all that dynamic range using ribbons but tremendous, at, a, at tremendous expense. So if you're going to use just one tweeter, a, a cone, a cone driver is a real good way to go. you got nice wide dispersion pattern with, these, with the uh, dome tweeters. Not so with ribbons. They're very narrow, especially in the horizontal plane. Uh, so you have those issues to deal with. Uh, with dome tweeters, there's lots of different options available. There are these hard dome tweeters, soft dome tweeters, all kind of different. And the soft domes all kind of sound the same. The hard dome tweeters are all very different. Uh, these aren't very, very bright. These sound absolutely wonderful. I have a pair of uh, Audax hard dome tweeters I didn't pull out over here. But they sound, re they are really bright. And they're a bit too much in an active design, in my opinion. But So you have to carefully choose your tweeter, but um, lots of different options available. There are many high-quality dome tweeters that are being produced, so it's not like you're going to miss out on anything. If you get these Etons, I, I would recommend these. They're fabulous. But they might be too bright. They are hard dome tweeter. They're very bright. They might be too much for somebody. These are much, much softer as a hard dome tweeter. Soft dome tweeters are preferred by, I think, by probably most people prefer the soft domes because there's no chance that they'll irritate your ears. Um, I want to hear the cymbals as if they're in the room. I want to hear the horn player as if he's right in the room. And if you ever heard, heard live music with the stuff right next to you, yeah, the stuff can be a little bright to your ears. Well, that's what I want to hear because um, I played music for many, many years in bands, and so that's my orientation. That's different from other people, so that's fine. The desirable characteristics I'm looking for is, I mentioned already, hard dome design. You're looking for a flat response above, above 1,500. You won't get any, anything flat below 15. So, because you're not going to use a tweeter down below 15. You're going to cross it at 2, 25, 3,000 cycles. So you're looking for a nice, flat, clean response. That's what these drivers have. That's not true with all tweeters, and I don't really understand, frankly, why tweeters are designed with these big bumps or, or a crawl. At, they, they climb up in their response curve above... Um, 
uh, t above 10,000. I don't understand why tweeters are designed that way. But uh, I'm looking for nice flat response, uh, a low resonant frequency. Oftentimes they have chamber. These don't have. These have, a, uh, I believe, a second magnet for 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 uh, protection from of uh, things. Neodymium magnet, but these don't have. Uh, some tweeters have a uh, have a uh, a chamber and they're a vented pole, and so they provide nice low FS or low resonant frequency. Uh, not necessary, not essential, but uh, that's a nice characteristic, a nice feature. You want a nice low resonant frequency so that you can cross it one or two octaves above that. So if you got a resonant frequency at 750, you can cross that at 1500, 2000, 3000, no problem. Uh, what else? One inch dome, not essential. I think both of these are one inch dome. Three quarter inch dome would be fine. Uh, um, good power handling. I mentioned the rear chamber already and brand name. Uh, these are uh, timpanis, and uh, this is Eton, and the Audax ones I have. And of course, I love Folk Al drivers when they made them. They don't make individual drivers anymore. Those are my favorites. Okay, next up, we're going to talk about mid range drivers. And we have a couple of options. We see commonly four inch mid range drivers, five and a quarter like these, and six and a half being used. Uh, so the concerns here are. Uh, be sure that the driver must have wide frequency response throughout its region and this is covering five octaves so you got from 100 cycles all the way up to 3000 uh, the other challenge for the mid-range driver it must its response must extend smoothly well within the crossover region so if you're going to cross it to a tweeter you need that response especially in a passive design you need that response to be very smooth up to three four five thousand without deviation in order to get a nice smooth flat response within this crossover region uh, in a passive design just as the tweeter must also be smooth down to 1500 so uh, the larger the, the mid-range driver the more likely it is to have some problems in that upper region so I like to choose the five and a quarter for that region for that reason because the more likelihood of having a nice smooth response in the upper in the upper uh, region above the crossover frequency and one other thing in terms of uh, beaming, the five, the six and a half will tend to start beaming. That is, the off-axis response drops off below, above, say, 1,500 or 2,000, certainly. And if we're crossing it to 3,000, as I like to do with tweeters to keep these from, from honking, you want to cross them as high as you can. So I like the smaller driver for that reason, the five and a quarter versus six and a half, so that there's no issue with beaming. Some of the things I'm looking for with uh, mid-range drivers when I look at them, I'm looking for that flat response. I want to see a nice smooth response curve from 100, 100, 150 cycles up all the way through to two, three, four thousand cycles. Uh, second of all, I like to see alternative cone materials. There's nothing wrong with paper or even poly cones. But when I see a driver manufacturer go to a lot of trouble to produce a specialized cone material, they're chasing after a certain characteristic sound. I mentioned, I think, before how different these drivers sound in terms of uh, because of the type of cone they're using. They're very, very different in their sound. And you might like this one over this one. I like the, the metal cone, the coated metal cone over this one a lot more than this one. Uh, both of these are very inexpensive drivers. These aren't, uh, I'm not lifting these up as paragons of terrific quality, but I'm just, just as reference points. So I look for different cone materials. The, the uh, Focals that I use have this W cone, of a, it's a sandwiched composite cone. The Etons I'm looking at are, a, are called a hexacone, so they've gone to a lot of trouble to develop a specific cone material for their drive and their mid-range drivers. And that's all about chasing the tonal characteristic of the driver. So I'll be interested in seeing what those sound like when I grab some. So I'm looking for that. Uh, a one inch voice coil number three is a common place. A vented pole, I don't believe <clears throat> either. Well, this one probably has a vented pole and this is a chamber. It probably has a second magnet on here, a cancellation magnet, uh, so that it doesn't provide uh, uh, electromagnetic interference with other electronics or whatever. And that's what the cover is all about. But it may be, may or may not be vented, I don't know, and have some uh, dampening material in there. Uh, these, these don't have a vented pole. They're vented here. It's a different kind of a design. It's vented here. This is your, your spider. On, I don't know if you can see that in the camera. This is the spider here, and then the vent ventilation of the, of the voice coil happens on the side. It's a very unique design. I really think they're cool. 
Anyway, so we're looking for that uh, vented pole. Usually it's a vented pole with a, on the back of the chamber uh, with some perhaps some stuffing in the, in the back. A rubber surround is commonplace with drivers. I like rubber surrounds. The foam surround materials used in the past would fail over a period of years, and uh, that would be very disappointing. A lot of old speakers had their, their drivers fail because the foam just deteriorated over time. Uh, there are make, they are making, apparently, new foam materials that are superior to the, to the rubber in terms of their elasticity, and they last for, for decades, apparently. So they've kind of changed the design. Some drivers, I, I, I wouldn't know how to pick out which ones are different than that. I like a large magnet, so because I'm gonna the mid range has to produce a lot of power. This is plenty of magnet for the for these uh for mid range drivers. Uh, I like to chase after brand names. Uh, I, I, I will for my high end system choose the Etons. Etons been making drivers for a very long time, they're real high quality, so I'll choose the Eton mid range. Uh, Morel and Siaz and Scanspeak and there's all kinds of different driver manufacturers making very high quality drivers and they're all consider a look. Uh, but I like to stick with a brand name. Now, the, as far as alignment goes, I'm not concerned with the vented alignment for a mid-range driver. I'm going to put it in a sealed box, so I don't care about how how the what the vented alignment offers. Uh, it's going to be in a sealed alignment and with a hundred cycle F3 for that. Okay, and finally, with uh, base drivers, uh, the first consideration is the lowest frequency goal. How far down should this driver go? And now we're talking about not just a driver, but a driver in a box. So it's a system. The, the driver in the box becomes a single unit. And so with that system, the goal is 30 cycles. Now we need to know that because we need to pick a driver that's going to have an alignment, be it vented or whatever, that's going to provide us a F3 or three decibel down point where the frequency begins to drop off. We want that down around 30 cycles. That's always been my goal. Uh, if you don't have that goal, if you're going to uh, have a sealed system and you're going to have an F3 of 50 cycles or something, regardless of the driver size, sealed systems generally get you down about 50 cycles and it drops after that. You can equalize it. It'll have a different character than unequalized and invented design. Uh, but in any case, if that's the goal, that's our lowest limit. And then the small, the issue here is that as, as you get in down into small base drivers, and this is not well understood, but you get into a driver like this five and a quarter, it's going to have its resonant frequency, its lowest uh, producing frequency down around 50, 60 cycles or something. You can't get this driver natively to get down to 30 cycles then. It's not going to happen. So uh, the larger the driver, the lower the resonant frequency, the, the better the chance it can go down low. Also, and it's designed that way. I don't know if you can design a small driver for low resonant frequency, but it's just not designed to do bass because it's so small. One of the things we'll talk about is a large size. So as you get into larger size bass drivers and you look for resonant frequency characteristic, you find the lower F3, FS. It's called FS, or frequency of the speaker, uh, the resonant frequency of the speaker. So the FS for this driver here is in the 30 cycle range. I don't remember what it is for the 10. I know for this for this 12 inch driver, it's down around 22 or something. So we want to get it down into the 20s if possible. And so I, and so for that reason, I'm going to be preferring the 10 or the 12. I've made some uh, base boxes out of with eight inch drivers. I've used them in two way designs. So it's basically a base driver and a mid range driver. And I just put a couple of these in their own boxes as base speakers. And they can get down to 30 cycles, so that's pretty good. So that's the goal, to get down to 30 cycles. Uh, the other issue is that uh, if I, I had did this one time, I had all these different systems. I had a guy come over and wanted to hear my different systems. So I set up all these sort of tests for an 8-inch two-way system, a 10-inch three-way, and a 12-inch three-way. And as you went up in base driver size, the difference, and I'd never done that before, but the having ha, taking him through it allowed me to go through it and hear the different characters of the base from 8 to 10 to 12. It's quite remarkable. It depends on the design, of course. Uh, these were all large vented designs, so they were comparable. But just the bigger drivers have a bigger character. I've got a, a viewer on YouTube here who uh, swears by his 18-inch base drivers in his room. I think that's overkill, but uh, he swears by him. So the, for me, the goal is uh, 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 the, 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 an F3 down around 30 cycles or in the 20s if I can get it. I'd get 20 if I could, but I, I've never been able to develop a system that would get me an F3 to 20 cycles. But 
uh, or not been willing to spend the money to what it would take to do that. So, but anyway, because of that goal and because of the larger drivers producing such deeper character, the character that I'm really after, my preference is for 10 inch or 12 inch space drivers. Uh, again, I think if I were to build a system today for a big room, like a 300 square foot room, I'd choose two tens instead of 112. But that's a, a we talked about that I think earlier, in terms of transient uh, improved transient response. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm looking for a low FS, uh, I'm, uh, the fuller base character of the large drivers, and and you have to reckon, you have to realize to get F3 down around 30 cycles that calls for vent the drivers will require a vented design and when you choose a driver then you look at the alignment and i found the alignments offered by some uh, uh, providers aren't very accurate and won't work very well i go to mattisound mattisound measures their drivers they'll give you a, a box alignment a vented alignment or whatever that will work very well their vented alignments always work very well for me I'm very happy with them. So I've had to go to them exclusively for alignments. But anyway, I'm going to use a large vented alignment system. In other words, a big box uh, for an eight. It would be a uh, one and a half cubic feet or 40 liters for a 10. It's two cubic feet or whatever that is, 60 liters, I think. And then for a 12, I'm talking about three cubic feet, whatever the liters are of that. So uh, big boxes. Uh, uh, what uh, my notes say the 10 inch driver is going to be a bit faster than the 12s. I already talked about that, so I would use two of those. Some of the characteristics I'm looking for nothing wrong with treated paper like the 10s that you saw in the introduction in this system we're listening to. Uh, uh, these are poly cones, I think. Both of these, this is a metal cone. Uh, paper or poly is fine for base. Uh, a low FS, I already mentioned, down around 20 cycles. I'm looking for a two inch voice coil. A lot of tens that don't have a two-inch voice coil. I, I insist on that. It's got to be a big voice coil. Uh, at least a two for a ten. Uh, a vented pole. Most of these have the vented pole. You see that? Oh, no, the hole here, so it it vents the voice coil, so you're not getting air compression when this in, inside the voice coil region when your driver is working. Uh, I believe all three of these have a, all three of these have a vented pole. Yeah, they all three have a vented pole. You see the vent in that one. Small vent, but it's a small driver. Um, rubber surround, of course. I mentioned that the foam surround's failing. They're making new foam surround materials that don't fail. That's great, but all these, all these old drivers have rubber surround. They work great. Large magnet. The, uh, there's a whole issue around having a magnet that's too big, and it can constrain the function, the function of the driver, so that's a whole other topic. But generally speaking, magnet size of this for a 12-inch driver perfectly adequate. You'll get all the base you ever need if you get two of those in the room. Uh, brand name. Uh, that's a that's a Dayton audio. Uh, brand name, as long as it has all the, uh, the right characteristics. These 10-inch space drivers were Vifa. Vifa's not known for their high-end drivers by any means, but they had all the right stuff, and they sound fantastic. So, really pleased with them. Uh, and then, of course, I mentioned when I pick, pick a base driver, I'm looking for the alignment. I want the large vented alignment. Some drivers don't call for a large, maybe that small vented alignment. This driver, in fact, I bought for a sealed design. Its vented design is much too big. It's like four cubic feet or something crazy for a single 10-inch driver. There are other 10-inch drivers available that have a large vented alignment in the two cubic foot range. So that would be preferable. There are, and then there are 10-inch drivers with a vented alignment that's only one cubic foot. That wouldn't be acceptable. So I'm picking a driver based on its base alignment. Uh, if I'm going to choose, um, I'm going to use a vented alignment, I'm going to look for a driver that's going to call for a two cubic foot box if it's 10, or a three cubic foot box if it's a 12, or one and a half cubic foot box if it's an eight. These actually call for um, over two cubic feet, two and a half cubic feet or something, much too big for an eight inch driver. So I don't know what I'm going to end up doing with these, but anyway, so that's all I have for today, and uh, stay tuned and look for a uh, Part two, we'll be talking all about crossovers. I'll see you all then.